Hi, I'm Patricia Ercolino, and this edition of Sojourners Along the Way is going to give you a lot of information. May I suggest you may want to use a pen, pencil, and paper, because there are going to be a number of websites, telephone numbers, and also some delicious recipes. A lot of information from people who have been there people that have succeeded, and doctors who have been willing to allow me to use their information um, on this program and other programs that Sojourners produces. So please, I know that health is a very important thing today. In fact, just a little personal note. I wish I had known the things that I have been learning during this past year when I was younger. It would have helped my dad, and I would have liked him to have had his last years to have been much healthier than what they were. He had heart issues and kidney issues. It was very difficult to balance his medicines because the medicines used are totally opposite. I also want you to know, as stated in a previous program, it has been shown that children in the United States by the age of 10 are already showing signs of heart disease. And someone that I was talking to said that when he was an, an intern that he learned that it was at age 23, which he was 23 at that time, they were learning that Alzheimer's, the onslaught of it, was already evident in a lot of people's lives. I know that that's a topic that is of interest because just between two different websites, over a million hits were made on just two websites. So please, please pay close attention. Dr. Neil Bernard, MD, very graciously has given permission for us to use his information. His website is www.pcrm.org. Dr. Michael Greger and both Dr. Neil Bernard and Dr. Michael Greger are MDs. And Dr. Greger's uh, website is www.nutritionfacts.org. Dr. Drozak is here locally in Athens. His phone number is 740-753-7323. And a website for him is www.thelifestylemedicineclinic.us. Another one is www.thelifestyledoc.us. And he has a lot of good information. And also Dr. Katie Croft. Her phone number is 740-593-2516. Dr. Rozak and also Dr. Croft are both in Athens. And they are giving free classes to help people to prevent disease. And I applaud both of these doctors that are here in Athens, Ohio, because they left lucrative practices to go into lifestyle medicine because they saw the success. They saw it is possible to prevent disease through lifestyles. So please, please pay attention to today, today's program. A couple of programs, Sojourners Along the Way, introduced you to Arlene Basil, who is a chip foodie. And we're using part of a clip to show you how she suggests to cut a, a pepper, because one of the recipes is stuffed peppers. But this can be used, you can modify it and use it for um, the dish that is going to be given to you. And also, I want to reinforce uh, two places that are here in Athens County that have a lot of options regarding good health. One is the Bulk Food Depot. 
That is located on Route 50. If you're going from Athens to Albany, it'll be on the left-hand side of the road over by uh, Carter Lumber. And also the pharmacy, which is on Stimson Avenue. The people at both of these places are very friendly and want to be helpful. So Sojourners Along the Way invites you to learn about good health today. My name is Alan M. Cohn, and I am almost 83 years old, next month as a matter of fact. I have Alzheimer's disease. That's the bad news. The good news is that with the help of my neurologist, I have found an effective treatment for this miserable disease. Even though the experts say that's impossible, I saw my father die of this, of this disease and I swore that it would not get me and it won't. Now I have a bad heart, that'll probably get me, but it, it isn't going to be Alzheimer's. About eight years ago, almost nine years ago, I began to exhibit the symptoms. Lost the ability to drive and find my way home, lost the ability to walk and find my way home, lost the ability to write, lost the ability to read lost the ability to even speak a single cohesive sentence and remember where I was going. And they were looking for an Alzheimer's home for me. Instead, I came down here to Palm City, Florida, where my son-in-law, an otolaryngologist, found a very good neurologist for me. She put me on an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor uh, called Razodyne, gradually increased the dosage. And that'll give you several months of mental clarity until it fails. But it doesn't have to fail, and that's what I discovered. Now, uh, so I can say with the help of my neurologist, I found an effective treatment for this miserable disease. And it's never going to get me. In the months of mental clarity that the drug Razodine gave me, I researched and found a daily cocktail of dietary supplements which along with the Razodine, you have to take the drug and the, and the cocktail the rest of your life, uh, stopped and substantially reversed my Alzheimer's disease. The so-called experts say that, that this is impossible as I said before and that no one survives this disease. They are wrong. You're looking at somebody who claims he has survived, and you can too, or your loved ones. In the months of the mental clarity, of mental clarity that the drug gave me, I researched and found why the so-called experts had failed in every attempt they had made. The drug does not have to fail like they think it does. There are secondary effects of uh, Alzheimer's, such as beta amyloid plaques and other things that they don't even know about. But nature has taken care of it. The uh, populations of uh, the Indian subcontinent don't suffer from Alzheimer's. The populations of the North American Eskimos in the Arctic Circle don't uh, suffer from Alzheimer's. Something in their diets, and I will list that, and I'll list the supplements and the foods, prevents them from ever getting the disease. Okay, here's what I take in my daily cocktail. First I take the drug Razodine, as I said before, every single day. Then every day I take turmeric, which is curry. Got that from the Indian subcontinent of more than a billion people. So I have a statistical evidence that this works. The dosages can be found on the labels. The only label I violate, I take two turmeric a day, not just one. I always take all of my supplements with food so I don't get fish burps or burning in the stomach. If I do, I neutralize it with Tums. I also take omega-3 fish oil supplements with high amounts of DHA. 
I put organic flaxseed meal on my uh, morning cereal, but not everybody can convert that to omega-3, so that's just sort of an insurance policy. I also take the following vitamins and foods. I take vitamin D3 and B12. Both of these are hard to assimilate after you're past the age of 55. So I take the supplements, and B12 is even harder to assimilate. The supplements sometimes don't work. So I eat chicken livers or giblets, which is a heart, liver, and, and uh, uh, gizzard of uh, poultry. Uh, the foods you don't have to take every day. The foods you can just take two or three times a week. The supplements, however, have to be taken every day along with the rasodine without fail. Always with meals, by the way. Now the cold water fish, an example of those are wild salmon, cod, haddock, and tuna fish. I also eat lots of curried foods. Again, using to, uh, Tums to put out the fire if I get a fire in the stomach. I take a multivitamin and mineral supplement, but no iron. Uh, I do that daily, but I'm not sure how important that is or how functional it is. I do that just also as an insurance policy. That's it. That's the whole formula right there, but there's more to tell uh, in the story. You, as I said, you must take the drug and these dietary supplements and it, uh, every day of your life or you will regress. It takes several months for this cocktail to work, and you and I... I emphasize that you must continue to take this entire cocktail the foods not necessarily every day but the cocktail every single day along with the Razodine for the rest of your life which is not a bad price to pay to stay alive and to keep your brains alive I had already had a radical brain shrinkage by the time I started this treatment and I still came back I posted a YouTube series under the title Al's Apostrophe S Alzheimer's that's of course uh, Apostrophe S Al's Alzheimer's Diet telling why this cocktail works and why the medical world will not approve this cocktail of course there is no pot of gold for big pharma in this effective treatment and the FDA will not appre uh, approve either even your neuro neurologist will not openly approve but you must tell him or her that what you are doing. They will keep records and eventually get together to force the medical experts to accept this treatment. Because believe me, if it works on me, it's going to work on anybody and everybody who needs it. And the Federation of American and Alzheimer's Association has, Associations has predicted that by the middle of the century, the year 2050, more than 100 million people will be suffering and dying from this terrible disease. And their families will be suffering right along with them. This does not have to be, and this cocktail will prevent this from happening. In fact, there's even evidence that the supplements even without the Razodine, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, might prevent you from ever getting this disease in the first place. But if you already have it, you have to go to a neurologist, tell her what you're doing, don't expect her to prove it, but she won't stop you either, she or he. Uh, and I'm counting on the neurologist to back this up as they see and get statistically significant samples of recovering patients, which has never happened before. I have already reported, as I said to you before, in a series, I think five or six items, about less than 20 minutes, all the details as to why this works. All of the uh, statistical evidence and the uh, populations which don't get it. Uh, Please report your successes to my son at the following email address. DefeatAD at gmail.com So Dr. Alzheimer's has become mm -hmm. such a big problem in this country. Uh, 
you're an educated woman, you're a, a doctor, you, you do your research, you find something that mm -hmm. you think might, you know, start a spark or something, mm -hmm. but it had trouble catching on. Why yeah. <laughs> Why is is that? Why weren't more people saying, hey, let's look into this? Right, right. I, I know I did everything <laughs> yeah. I could think of to try to get this information out. Um, the uh, medical food was still a year away from being out on the market, and it was available over the counter. You know, I knew mm -hmm. as coconut oil, and then I learned that MCT oil is available over the counter too. I just bought it for nine dollars a bottle, um, a four pack on uh, Amazon the other day. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a very inexpensive yeah. treatment, and that that's enough to last for months. Okay. Um, so. Um, I started a letter writing campaign and um, my sister um, Angela suggested that the first one I write to is um, uh, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. She was on the Alzheimer's study group. Her husband um, had Alzheimer's at that point and um, that seemed like a very logical place to start and I basically wrote her a letter relaying, you know, what I had told you, you know, what I had learned about uh, this medical food and how it would work and that it did work, and I realized my husband's only one case, but he's mm -hmm. he's uh, <coughs> proof of um, you know that that this is possible, and that if he responded, other people would respond. And what I suggested was that this um, you know this concept uh, regarding this medical food you know needed to be looked at urgently, you know, so that um, this information would get out to the masses, you know, people, so that they can try this. Mm -hmm. And they did have clinical trials; uh, they were relatively small trials. Um, it wasn't just purely speculative, and, and they, they had a longer study with 152 people that, again, showed over a period of months that there was improvement in, in roughly half the people that took it. So, you know, I felt like this, this is the, the best thing out there, you know, for Alzheimer's. There's really nothing else, you know, that offers anybody hope. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just felt that they needed their medical people to look at it. If it seemed reasonable, put it on the fast track, you yeah. know. Um, do the clinical trials, you know, whatever needs to be mm -hmm. done. And um, um, but it being a food, what is the harm in people trying it in the meantime? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know. So um, I basically got almost no response. You know, I her letter, the letter to her was forwarded to the Alzheimer's Association, and they basically said, "Well, we'll get, we'll look at this, and we'll get back with you." And then I didn't hear anything. And uh, six weeks or so later, I sent them another letter. But you know, in the meantime, I wrote to politicians, uh, media people, uh, Fox, CNN, you know, everybody, mm -hmm. you know, just to try to get somebody to pay some attention to this. And and um, it was very frustrating, you know, because there are you know over five million people in the United States suffering from this, and almost 30 million worldwide. And um, you know, coconut oil is readily available. And it's mm -hmm. on the shelf. And you know, I remember seeing uh, a documentary that was put out by the um, Alzheimer's Association. I was watching it, and <laughs> this uh, man on there said, um, "For all we know, maybe there's something on the shelf that could help people with Alzheimer's." And I'm screaming at him, "There is!" <laughs> but nobody will listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it was very frustrating. And um, you know, the other thing too, you know, that I learned fairly early on was that there was a ketone ester in development at the NIH. And it's the ketone, the same ketone, you know, that your body produces when you consume the medium chain triglycerides or when you break down fat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dr. Richard Veach at the NIH um, has been working on this since the 1990s. And uh, he um, <coughs> came up with a formulation around 2006 that, um, you know, can be consumed and it, your liver will convert it. Uh, part of it's already ketone and the rest of it is converted to ketone. Um, crosses the blood-brain barrier. Um, he showed in some of his studies that it would, um, you know, uh, neurons and of uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's models. Um, uh, there are more survivors of neurons that are exposed to this ketone um, when they put them into cultures, and um, so it needed clinical testing. Um, and but he's basically being ignored. Um, he produces uh, enough uh, that would possibly take care of one or two people um, in his lab. I mean, that, that's how much he can produce. Okay. He needs uh, funding for mass production and for clinical trials. And NIH and you know, other sources just haven't come through you know, for this. And it's something that's very promising. And it's not just Alzheimer's. Um, there are other diseases that have a problem with um, insulin resistance or you know, decreased glucose uptake into cells. And uh, Parkinson's is one. Um, Huntington's Korea. Um, 
MS, um, diabetes type 1 and 2. I mean, people have, you know, the organs, the eyes, the liver, the kidney, you know, have a problem with um, uh, insulin resistance and, um, you know, ketones can address uh, the problem in, in other organs as well as the brain. People with diabetes are more likely to develop dementia. Um, people with traumatic brain injury, um, uh, uh, they, uh, the brain uh, loses the ability to use glucose normally after an insult like that for a period of several days, and that's where a lot of the brain damage comes from. Okay. But the apparatus to use ketones is there, mm -hmm. you know, so the ketone could provide alternative fuel for that. Mm -hmm. So um, it's very frustrating that there's something that promising in a lab mm -hmm. here in the U.S. Then the lab's already funded by the NIH, but they just won't allow enough funding to really look at it um, and do the, the clinical and push it along. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems urgent to me that something like that should be pushed along. My amazing, sweet, and beautiful mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in March 2009. There are seven stages through the slowly progressive disease of Alzheimer's. These stages build upon one another and often overlap, making it difficult to know where a person is in the disease progression. It was very hard for me to distinguish what stage my mom was in and when. However, now that there is little doubt she is fully in stage 6 and I understand these stages better, I feel very strongly that I need to make this video in hopes that it will help someone watching get diagnosed sooner. Stage 1, no impairment. This photo is my mom and our oldest son Tristan in the fall of 2000 when she was in stage 1. Individuals with Alzheimer's disease have a buildup of two types of abnormal bodies that clog their brains, beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Researchers say these plaques and tangles start to form up to 20 years prior to the first symptoms even being noticeable. Stage 2, very mild impairment. During stage 2, very mild forgetfulness is present and can easily be blamed on stress or normal aging if the person is older, unlike my mom. The symptoms are very subtle at this stage and are usually not detected by family, friends, or medical providers. Stage 3, mild decline. Stage 3 shows increased problems with short-term memory and inability to learn new materials and trouble planning and organizing. Simple tasks such as planning and fixing a meal become difficult. Word issues such as word substitutions become noticeable. Other behaviors such as putting household items in strange places, moodiness, isolating themselves, and hiding symptoms become common. Family members may notice these behaviors as well as the patient lying and making false accusations against people in their lives. The person most likely is aware that something is wrong but may not admit it. Family members and friends may begin to worry, but denial, depression, and anxiety can be present and make it difficult to distinguish between these and what is truly happening. Stage 3 is usually when misdiagnosis occurs. Stage 4, moderate decline. Stage 4 presents increased decline in short-term memory. The ability to remember recent events is drastically impaired. Everyday tasks become more and more difficult, the planning of them as well as executing them. Higher level tasks such as managing finances becomes extremely difficult. Individuals will repeat statements, stories, or questions over and over. They may also dress inappropriately 
no longer participate in hobbies, have mood swings, and have paranoia. So, in fall 2008, I started searching for the best doctor I could find, Dr. Burnick of the Lou Rubo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic for Brain Health in Las Vegas, Nevada, diagnosed my mom with Alzheimer's in March 2009. A diagnosis of Alzheimer's is never 100%, but he felt my mom had either frontotemporal dementia, Pick's disease, or Alzheimer's. After comparing scans from 2007 and 2009, he felt Alzheimer's was the best diagnosis as she had shrinkage throughout her brain. People often ask me if my mom knows she has Alzheimer's, or they will ask me how she reacted to this diagnosis. Many people will acknowledge and comprehend that they have this disease. This was not the case with my mom. Stage 5 presents severe gaps in memory and judgment. Safety and personal hygiene become major issues. Alzheimer's patients will need assistance to manage day to day with all activities. Their conversations may be repetitive or become fixated on one subject. They no longer have the ability to understand complex ideas. However, they can usually remember significant details about themselves and their lives. Hygiene became more and more of an issue as this stage progressed. She went from being able to somewhat take care of her hygiene to ignoring it or doing things like putting lotion in her hair. Bathing has been completely assisted since 2010. Stage 6 severe decline. During this stage, patients become more and more unaware of their surroundings. They may know their own name and will probably distinguish between familiar and unfamiliar people, but won't know family or friends' names, who they are, or why they are familiar. They will not be able to identify familiar objects or use them correctly. Caregivers will need to provide assistance with normal everyday tasks and activities such as toileting, bathing, dressing, and eating. Conversation may not make sense as words and sounds become tangled and jumbled. Anxiety presents itself in wringing of the hands, shredding tissues, repetitive actions, or picking at clothing or skin. Sundowning behaviors are most apparent at this stage. Sundowning is when such behaviors as agitation, suspiciousness, delusions, aggressiveness, repetitive behaviors, pacing, and wandering become more noticeable during the late afternoon and early evening. Sundowning can be hard to cope with for caregivers. Stage 7, very severe decline. Stage 7 is the final stage of this devastating disease. Complete care is required. The patient will not recognize their surroundings or themselves. They will lose the ability to walk, hold their head up, or communicate in a meaningful manner. The patient's muscles will become rigid. They will also slowly lose their ability to swallow. Alzheimer's is a fatal disease of the brain that is currently affecting over 5 million Americans. It is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. I find peace and strength in Jesus and know that even though this wasn't my plan, it is somehow in His plan. I have to trust in Him. This journey has changed me tremendously. I never felt I had what it takes to be a caregiver, but this is God's will. I feel strongly that God's purpose for me is bigger, so I not only do my best to care for her, but I also document our journey making videos like this one in hopes it will somehow help others. I feel extremely blessed and honored to have time with my mom.
to half of Alzheimer's cases may be attributable to just these seven risk factors, and that's not including diet, just because there's so many dietary factors they couldn't fit them into their model. But they acknowledge that diet might be another important modifiable risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. In particular, there's growing evidence that dietary patterns, such as the Mediterranean diet, are associated with lower Alzheimer's risk, as well as slower cognitive decline. But which constituents of the Mediterranean diet are responsible? Uh, the traditional Mediterranean diet is a diet high in intake of vegetables, beans, fruit, and nuts, and low in meats and dairy. When they tried to tease out the protective components, fish consumption showed no benefit. Neither did moderate alcohol consumption. The two critical pieces appeared to be vegetable consumption and the ratio between unsaturated fats and saturated fats, essentially plant fats to animal fats. In studies across 11 countries, fat consumption appeared to be most closely associated with the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, with the lowest fat intake in Alzheimer's rates in China to the highest fat in Alzheimer's rates in the United States. But this is grouping all fats together. Harvard researchers examined the relationship between the major fat types to cognitive change over four years among 6,000 healthy older women, and found that higher saturated fat intake was associated with a poorer trajectory of cognition and memory. Women with the highest saturated fat intake had 67% greater odds of worse change on brain function. The magnitude of cognitive change associated with saturated fat consumption was equivalent to about six years of aging, meaning women with the lowest saturated fat intake had the brain function of women six years younger. What if one already has Alzheimer's, though? Previously, this group of Columbia University researchers reported that eating a Mediterranean-style diet was related to lower risk for Alzheimer's disease. But whether a Mediterranean diet, or any diet for that matter, is associated with subsequent course of the disease and outcomes had yet to be in investigated until now. They found that adherence to the Mediterranean diet may affect not only risk for Alzheimer's disease, but also subsequent disease course. Higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet was associated with lower mortality, and the more they adhered to the healthier diet, the longer they lived. Within five years, only 20% of those with high adherence died with twice as many deaths in the intermediate adherence group and the low diet adherence group, within five years, more than half were dead. And by 10 years, 90% were gone. 80% were gone, or less than half. And by the end of the study, the only people still alive were those with high adherence to the healthier diet. Intake of saturated fats and added sugars, two of the primary components of modern Western diet, is linked with the development of Alzheimer's disease. Now, there's been a global shift in dietary composition from traditional diets, high in starches and fiber, to what's been turned the Western diet, high in fat and sugar, low in whole plant foods. What's so great about fruits and vegetables? Plant-derived foods contain thousands of compounds with antioxidant properties, some of which can traverse the blood-brain barrier and have neuroprotective effects by assisting with antioxidant defense. There's this concept of brain rust, that neurodegenerative diseases arise from excess oxidative stress. But nature has gifted humankind with a plethora of plants, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and a diverse array of bioactive nutrients present in these natural products may play a pivotal role in prevention, one day even perhaps cure various neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease. Accumulated evidence suggests that naturally occurring plant compounds may potentially hinder neurodegeneration and even improve memory and cognitive function, as I've you know, shared in my videos about blueberries and strawberries and treating Alzheimer's with spices like saffron and turmeric. Vegetables may be particularly protective in part because of certain compounds we eat that concentrate in our brain, found in dark green leafy vegetables, the consumption of which are associated with lower rates of age-related cognitive decline. When you look at systematic reviews on what we can do to prevent cognitive decline, you'll see conclusions like this. The current literature does not provide adequate evidence to make recommendations for interventions. Same with Alzheimer's. Currently, insufficient evidence exists to draw firm conclusions on the association of any modifiable factors with risk of Alzheimer's disease. They cite the lack of randomized controlled trials as the basis for their conclusions. RCTs are the gold standard used to test new medicines. Uh, you know, you randomize people in two groups, half get the drug and half don't, to control for other factors. The highest level of evidence necessary because drugs may kill 
100,000 Americans every year. Not overdoses, not medication errors, not illicit drugs, just regular FDA-approved prescription drugs, the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. So you better make absolutely sure the benefits of new drugs outweigh the life-threatening risks. But we're talking about a healthier diet and exercise. The side effects are all good, so we don't need the same level of rigorous evidence to prescribe them. A modest proposal was published recently in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, an editorial calling for a longitudinal study of dementia prevention. They agreed that definitive evidence for the effectiveness of dementia prevention methods was lacking, so we need large-scale randomized trials. Let's start with you know, 10,000 healthy volunteers in their 20s, split them into five groups. There's evidence, for example, that traumatic brain injury is a risk factor for Alzheimer's because you know, people with head injuries appear more likely to get the disease, but it's never been put to the test. So let's take 2,000 people and beat half of them in the head with baseball bats, and the other half will use like styrofoam bats as like a control. Uh, until we have randomized controlled data, we can't just have physicians running around telling people not to get hit in the head. We should probably chain 1,000 people to a treadmill for 40 years and 1,000 people to a couch before recommending exercise. 1,000 forced to do crossword puzzles, another 1,000 forced to watch Jerry Springer reruns, lots of meat and dairy or not for the next 40 years, and you know uh, we can hook 1,000 folks on four packs a day just to be sure. Look, you know, we help our patients to quit smoking despite the fact that there's not a single randomized control trial where they you know, held people down and piped smoke in their lungs for a few decades. It's time to realize that the ultimate study in regards to lifestyle and cognitive health simply cannot be done. Right? Yet the absence of definitive evidence should not restrict physicians from making reasonable recommendations based on the evidence that is available. But then you might be saying, I think I might have the beginnings of Alzheimer's disease. Could that be? Doctors look for five things. They first look for, can you learn and remember? Then can you reason things out and solve problems? They also look for what's called visual spatial ability. Can you recognize shapes? If I ask you to draw a clock, can you get the numbers in order and that kind of thing? Then they also look at language, and then they look at personality. If all five of those things are goofing up, then doctors say, I think this could be Alzheimer's disease. All right. You go to the doctor. You say, I don't want that. My parents had Alzheimer's disease. My father had I, I don't want this. And the doctor sits you down, and they say, well, it's genetic. You should pick different parents. That's what you can do. Well, here, here are the numbers. If one parent gives you this gene called the ApoE Epsilon 4 allele, if you get that from one parent, you have three times the risk of Alzheimer's disease compared to not having it. And if you got it from both parents, you've got between 10 and 15 times the risk. And that's the end of the story for most people. Nothing you can do. Just wait and see what happens. Wait a minute. Turns out there's a lot you can do. Anybody know what this is? That is Chicago, exactly. And the reason I'm showing you Chicago is back in 1993, an important study began called the Chicago Health and Aging Project. And they brought in a group of, a large group, thousands of healthy people, and they carefully tracked what they were eating. And then, as one year and another year and another year and another year went by, they looked at links between what they had been eating and who stayed mentally clear and who did not. And the first thing that they tracked was something that I knew about when I was a kid. When I was growing up in Fargo, North Dakota, I'd run down to the kitchen. My mom would be cooking bacon. And her five kids would gather around, and she would take a fork and carefully pull the bacon strips out of the pan and put them on a paper towel to drain. And when all the bacon was out of the pan, she had a pan filled with hot grease that she was not going to throw away, right? So she would take that hot bacon grease and carefully pour it into a jar 
to save it. Now, the bacon, jar did, the bacon grease jar did not go in the refrigerator. She just put it on the shelf because she knew that as bacon grease cools down, what happens to it? It solidifies, right? It turns into this waxy solid. And the next day, she would spoon it back into the frying pan and fry eggs in it. It's amazing that any of her kids lived to adulthood, but that's what we did. Um, the fact that bacon grease is solid at room temperature is a sign that it's very high in what is called saturated fat. You've heard of saturated fat, right? This is the kind that raises your cholesterol. Well, it's in bacon. It's also in butter and other dairy products, and it's in meat. And these were things that we ate every day in, in growing up in Fargo, and maybe you grew up with the same kind of pattern. And that was the first thing that the researchers in Chicago started keying in on. Some people ate relatively little saturated fat, 13 grams a day. Others got about twice that amount, 25 grams a day. And they looked at who got Alzheimer's disease and who didn't. And here are the numbers. The people who got the 25 grams a day had more than three times the Alzheimer's risk compared to the others. Okay, so that's our first clue. And it's really, relatively easy to get up to that 25 grams a day. If I take a couple of eggs, that's three grams of saturated fat. Let, let me add a strip of bacon, that's another gram. Let me take a chicken thigh, even without the skin, it's about five grams of saturated. Did you know that chicken has a substantial amount of fat? About five grams in a chicken thigh with no skin. Glass of milk, another five grams. Oh yeah, pizza. Okay, so one pizza, pizza for one, is about 12, and you add that up, I'm in the high-risk group. Do, do you know anybody who eats that way? <laughs> Everybody eats that way. This is the way Americans eat. Okay, but it's not just Alzheimer's disease. Researchers in Finland said, what about this mild cognitive impairment? You remember me talking about this condition where you're still yourself, but your memory is starting to, to be bad. They brought in a group of people, and they, they were 50 years old when they brought them in. They tracked them up into their 70s, and they looked at who got, out, who got mild cognitive dementia, who didn't. And they tracked their saturated fat. Some were low, some were high in, in saturated fat. And here are the numbers. The people who got this bad fat had a lot more of the mild cognitive impairment also. So there's something about bacon grease and dairy fat and so forth that is harming the brain. Now, what about people who have that gene? Remember the APOE epsilon 4 allele, the one that condemns you? Well, they looked at those folks. Some people who had that gene avoided bad fats. Some people who had the gene didn't avoid them and they had a high fat intake. Here are the numbers. Dramatic difference. So, in other words, the people who had the gene, but they were avoiding the bad fats, tended to keep their memory. The people who had the gene and ate the bacon grease and so forth, their memories went. Is this making sense? Okay. So, oh, but, oh yeah, what about that? What about that? Well, you go into a typical donut shop, and the donuts are frying in, tra you know about trans fats, right? partially hydrogenated oil. This is the shortening they, they put in there. It's solid when they put it in. It heats up and it liquefies and it has that mouth feel that people like. It's in a lot of snack foods. And in Chicago, some people ate relatively little. Some people ate a lot of it. And here are the numbers. Dramatic difference. Okay, so about five times the risk if you eat, if you indulge in a lot of these trans fats versus not indulging it. Now, when doctors saw those numbers, when the research community saw those numbers, they were horrified because they thought, how many Americans are eating these bad fats? Not just, well, I mean, every day, a few times a day, these are routine. We feed them to kids. When I saw those numbers, I was thrilled because it means we can choose what we're going to eat starting right this minute. And we can start pushing the odds in our own favor. All right, so there are three steps for using power foods for the brain. The first is to skip the bad fats. The second is to knock out free radicals. In a minute, I'm going to tell you what they are. And the third thing is to exercise your brain. We're going to cover all of them. Okay, first, let's start with skipping the bad fats. All right, so I'm in Chicago and I'm eating all these bad things. Can I make some changes? Well, I better because my risk of Alzheimer's is high. So, what can I do? Let me get rid of that glass of milk. How about that? We'll get rid of that and we'll have, how many have, have tasted almond milk? It's fine, right? Very tasty, has no saturated fat. So if the numbers in Chicago apply to me, I just cut my risk of Alzheimer's disease because I got away from the saturated fat. 
Can I do better than that? Can I get rid of more foods? Easily, sure. Let's get rid of that bacon. How about having veggie bacon instead? Let's get rid of the eggs. How about a big bowl of oatmeal with blueberries and strawberries? Let's get rid of that chicken thigh. I'll have a big submarine sandwich filled with all the veggies. And how am I going to do? Well, if the research numbers apply to me, my Alzheimer's risk just fell even more. Is there something else that I can change? Oh, yeah. What about that pizza? Could I, could I get a vegan pizza? You know, pizza is a delivery vehicle for cheese. And so, you know it's true. So we're going to get rid of that. We're going to bring in the vegan pizza. And now, how am I doing? Well, I can't tell you because nobody in Chicago eats that well. But, <laughs> however, there are some people who eat that well. In Loma Linda, California, diets vary dramatically. And people at Loma Linda University tracked a group of what they called heavy meat eaters. And over a six-year period, they looked at who was gradually losing their brain function. And they compared them with a group of vegetarians. The vegetarians did a whole lot better. Okay? All right. So, by, by the way, you do need some fat, right? This is not, this is not a zero-fat diet. And the brain actually does need some good fats. So which fat is best for the brain? Is it A, corn oil, B, peanut oil, C, sunflower oil, or D, olive oil. The study I explored about how listening to Mozart can reduce allergic reactions reminded me of a similar study on humor. Take a bunch of people with dust mite allergies, half watched Charlie Chaplin, half watched the Weather Channel, then they injected them with dust mite poop, and the allergic response was significantly reduced after viewing the humorous video for a matter of hours, suggesting that the induction of laughter may play some role in alleviating allergic diseases. But might it suppress our immune system too much? No. Have people watch a comedian for an hour, and their natural killer cell activity goes up, compared to watching nothing. And their white blood count goes up, the number of immune cells in their bloodstream. The level of immune-boosting interferon goes up and stays up the next day. And the same with antibody production, pumping out more antibodies because yesterday you saw some video. So, Humor seems to offer the best of both worlds, of preventing the overreactive allergic response while boosting immune protection. But you actually have to laugh. The more you laugh, the better your natural killer cell activity gets, but exposure to a humorous video alone did not significantly affect immune function. Those that didn't laugh, maybe because it was a Bill Cosby video, did not benefit, reinforcing that it's not the funny video that improves immune function, but our laughter in response. Because of the role natural killer cells play in viral illness and various types of cancer, the ability to significantly increase their activity in a brief period of time using a non-invasive method could be clinically important the next time you have a cold or cancer. Laughter, like music or healthy food, offers potential benefits without any risk, or almost any risk. You've heard of side-splitting laughter, 67-year-old woman attending laughter therapy sessions, and evidently rapture led to rupture. Thankfully, you can't actually laugh your head off, but you can laugh until you wet yourself. It's called giggle incontinence in the medical literature, actually quite common in women and no laughing matter. So the next time you're in the theater, uh, should you choose the comedy over a tearjerker given the benefits of humor? Not necessarily. If you take people with a latex allergy and have them watch a weather video versus a heartwarming drama, viewing the weather information video did not cause emotion with tears, I should hope not, and it failed to modulate allergic responses. The tearjerker, however, successfully reduced the allergic response, but only in those whose tears were actually jerked. So to improve allergies, laughing works, crying works. I laughed, I cried, it was better than cats, especially if you have a cat allergy. Anything else you can do? Kissing. 
there's actually a whole science of kissing, which sounds a pleasant enough college major, until you realize it's about all the diseases you can get. But if you take people with seasonal pollen allergies or dust mite allergies, and have them kiss someone in a room for 30 minutes, they have a significant reduction in their allergic reactions for both the pollen and the dust mites. Whereas if you just have them hug for a half hour instead, no benefit. Bottom line, kissing significantly reduces allergic responses in patients with both allergic rhinitis, which runny nose, itchy eyes, or allergic dermatitis, like a rash. Collectively, these findings indicate that the direct action of love may be beneficial, though evidently cuddling wasn't quite direct enough. With all the side effects of antihistamine allergy drugs, you'd think it would be easy to get people to sign up for the study, but since sojourners along the way focused on Alzheimer's disease, we thought it might be helpful to give some recipes that would be helpful in battling against this disease. The recipes are all from Dr. Neil Bernard's book, Power Foods for the Brain. About any recipe, just remember it's a framework to work from. You can alter it, as long as it's healthy, any way that you would like. The first one is even called Brain Boosting Salad Recipe. And the recipe that is given serves two as a main dish or four as a side dish and it talks about the colors and the texture, how they're going to entice you that you'll want to eat this delicious salad. The ingredients are a red onion, Mexican gray squash or zucchini, a cucumber, small tomatoes, a cup of um, sliced red cabbage, stalks of celery, and two ears of corn. And if you want a pinch of sea salt, and a small lime. The suggestion that is optional is to use tomatillos, and it gives you the directions on how to, to prepare them in Dr. Neil Bernard's book, Power Foods for the Brain, which you can go online and get the entire recipe, not just here on the TV program. Sweet Potato Burritos Recipe. Sweet potatoes are really being focused on nowadays for how good they are for our bodies. They're a great antioxidant, and it strengthens your memory and immune system. So we highly, highly want to recommend foods, dishes that include sweet potatoes. This one is sweet potato burritos, and it, this recipe would serve about four people. You will use, obviously, sweet potatoes, frozen corn kernels, and low-sodium black beans. And I want to put in a plug for black beans. They are also getting a lot of attention nowadays because beans are good for our bodies. They help our bodies. High fiber, so that's a good thing to use. You also use green onion fresh lime juice, chili powder, and of course if you don't like chili powder you don't have to put it in, sea salt, and freshly ground pepper. Use whole wheat tortillas, and of course the type of salsa that you like, and shredded lettuce. There are several options given about how to pair, put them all together, and I hope you will enjoy it. For our pancake lovers, there's even a blueberry buckwheat pancake recipe. Whole grain, that's another thing. Try to incorporate whole grains into your diet because that will help on many levels. Food can be used to help our bodies to get better. There is medical evidence. Please get well acquainted with Dr. Neil Bernard and Dr. Michael Greger. Both of them have given sojourners along the way permission to use all of their materials, and so we are offering them to you now. So please make these blueberry buckwheat pancakes. Doesn't that sound delicious? They're a whole grain pancake that you can make and buckwheat flour, whole wheat pastry flour, Flaxseed meal. Flaxseed is another thing that is good for our bodies. A 
teaspoon of aluminum free baking powder and aluminum is something we need to be guarding against it does not do good things for our bodies sea salt rice milk there are other milks out there they are trying to suggest that we get away from the regular milk that maybe all of us grew up on but soy milk rice milk there's almond milk find out which one you like the best and then use that exchange do an exchange do little bits at a time but make some changes and they will be beneficial for your health and of course fresh blueberries or frozen blueberries there's oil but only a little bit just enough to brush the skillet you don't want these delicious pancakes swimming in oil and they do even suggest maple syrup but try to find some that is not a high fructose or high in sugar stuff peppers recipe now this recipe does use red peppers but your choice you want to use green purple yellow use whichever one you enjoy the most no matter which one you use it's gonna look pretty when you get done with it and it's a way to use leftover rice and black beans may I suggest stock up on black beans they are very good for our bodies and this recipe can be done very quickly on healthy eating with Arlene you will learn how to uh, cut a pepper and get the seeds out. This red pepper I'm going to cut that end off and then I'm going to cut this end off and then I'm going to kind of cut down one side so that you're holding the knife like this and your your hand or knuckles are down here so we're going to start cutting and then I'm going to hold it down it's flat like this against and I'm just going to give it a roll. I'm going to very slowly cut and roll my red pepper and be very careful when you come to the end and there it is. So red peppers, shredded lettuce and you can make a salad out of it all. The recipe includes cooked brown rice, black beans, Mexican gray squash or zucchini, your choice, green onions, green pumpkin seeds, garlic. Oh, garlic is wonderful for our bodies. And as an Italian, I highly want to encourage you, put garlic in your food, it is so good. A tablespoon of chopped fresh oregano. Again, as an Italian, you've got to use the oregano. Apple cider vinegar. And use the juice of a lime, a quarter of a teaspoon of sea salt and freshly ground black pepper. You want to use red bell pepper, green bell pepper, whatever color you want, and then optional is salsa. That sounds good to me. I hope you will enjoy these recipes. There's some things that you can exchange for their meals and to move into a healthier lifestyle. That's something that Sojourners along the way really wants to help our viewing audience with. We want to gain back what we have lost. So please enjoy these dishes.